today. Uh, welcome our members and our guests to the program on Art Nouveau 101 uh, to strengthen our community through learning, giving, and sharing our landmark building. I would like to introduce Kathleen Murphy Skolnick. She teaches art and architectural history at Roosevelt University and leads seminars on architecture and design at the Newberry Library. As an aside, the reason <laughs> that we even have Kathleen here is that myself and uh, Susie Helfrich went down to the Newberry Library to attend a seminar that Kathleen gave on Art Nouveau. And it was, I think it was at least six or eight hours. <laughs> so it has been quite a feat to boil this down to 45 minute presentation. And I really appreciate, I'm sure, a lot of the time that she spent trying to synthesize this a little bit. She's the co-author of the Art Deco murals of Hildreth Mier, a contributor to Art Deco Chicago, Designing Modern America, and editor of the English translation of Havana Art Deco, Architectural Guide by Maria Elena Martin Zakiera. She's a past editor of the Chicago Art Deco Society magazine and currently serves on the advisory board of the Art Deco Society of New York and the International Hildreth Mier Association. So let's welcome Kathleen, and I know we're in for a really excellent program. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, thank you, Judy, and thanks to the 19th Century Charitable Association for inviting me to speak, and thanks to all of you for coming today. Uh, as uh, Judy mentioned, we met when uh, she enrolled in the class on Art Nouveau that I was uh, teaching at the Newberry Library, Art Nouveau at Home and Abroad. And when the class ended, she asked if I would be interested in speaking to your group on that topic. So that's how this lecture came about. The class was uh, five weeks long, and there were, it was actually 10 hours. There was a two-hour lecture each week, and I showed uh, more than 1,200 images. So for today's presentation, I have condensed it to between about 45 and 50 minutes, and I've reduced the number of images to just below 200. <laughs> I'm going, so, but it'll go fast. Uh, I'm going to be addressing the meaning of Art Nouveau, its origins and its visual properties, the sources of those visual properties, and its dissemination. And then I'm going to show you examples of Art Nouveau from throughout the world with a special emphasis on areas where it was especially prevalent. Brussels, Belgium, Paris, France, Glasgow, Scotland, Vienna, Austria, and uh, Br uh, Barcelona, Spain. I want to begin with this question, what is Art Nouveau? It's not an easy question to answer. In fact, in a 1984 book, an Italian art critic stated, it is difficult, if not impossible, to formulate a simple definition of the style. But scholars have attempted to do so. The uh, glossary in the textbook that I use when I teach the art history survey at Roosevelt defines Art Nouveau as a late 19th and early 20th century art movement whose proponents tried to synthesize all the arts in an effort to create art based on natural forms that could be mass produced by technologies of the industrial age. And this definition takes into account several of the features associated with Art Nouveau. The, uh, the use of natural forms, uh, the synthesis into our harmonious whole, and the use of modern means of um, production. In his 1994 book, the art historian Alistair Duncan had this to say, and the italics are his. Art Nouveau was a movement, not a style, one that evolved differently in different countries in the late 19th century with the single purpose of defeating the established order within the applied and fine arts. I think Duncan's uh, characterization of Art Nouveau as a movement as opposed to a style is especially relevant. 
because the style implies some cohesiveness. And as you'll see when we look at examples of Art Nouveau, it could vary considerably among designers and among countries. The Art Nouveau designers were, uh, wanted to create a new modern aesthetic, but the way in which this impulse was expressed could differ widely. Duncan also points out another objective of the Art Nouveau designers, and that was to eliminate this uh, hierarchic distinction between the fine arts, painting and sculpture, and the applied or decorative arts like furniture and glass and textiles. This definition is from the introductory lecture in a catalog that accompanied the exhibition Art Nouveau, 1890 to 1914 which debuted in 2000 at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and then it traveled to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. The author, who is also the curator of the uh, exposition, wrote, In this volume, Art Nouveau is the name given to a style in the visual arts that was a powerful presence in Europe and North America from the early 1890s until the First World War. It existed in all genres, but the decorative arts were centrally responsible for its invention and its fullest expression. He goes on, There was one defining characteristic that held Art Nouveau together an idea bestowing the many movements and individuals with a vision that, regardless of different aesthetic solutions and national cultures, meant they all flowed in the same direction. This defining characteristic was modernity. Art Nouveau was the first self-conscious, internationally-based attempt to transform visual culture through a commitment to the idea of the modern. And as you can see, this definition really does emphasize modernity. And this is what distinguished Art Nouveau from the movements that had preceded it. And for me, this is the, the thread that holds Art Nouveau together, regardless of its visual expression. What about the origins of Art Nouveau? To trace the roots of Art Nouveau, I'm going to take you back to Victorian England. And here is the queen herself because the origins of Art Nouveau are rooted in the theories of 19th century British design reformers, most notably William Morris. The prevailing style during the second century, uh, of second um, half of the 19th century, uh, was described as Victorian revivalism a conglomeration of classical, Renaissance, Gothic, as one writer phrased it, something from every century except our own. <laughs> All crammed into spaces with little light and air. Furniture, decorative objects, wall hangings covered every conceivable surface. And here we're looking at a traditional uh, Victorian interior. As one critic stated, what do we see on every side? Wallpapers which wound the eye. Against them, ornate furniture which wounds the eye. At intervals, a gaudily draped bay which wounds the eye. And every spare nook and cranny is hung with plates of spinach with, with decorative borders which wound the eye. Let the eye come to terms with all this as best it can. <laughs> The objects on display in these rooms were made not by hand, but by the machines that had replaced the indi individual craftsmen of the pre-industrial age. The result was an abundance of poor quality objects uh, that were also very inexpensive. William Morris and his followers objected to the substandard quality of these objects as well as to their means of production. William Morris believed in the equality of art, art by the people for the people. As he wrote, I do not want art for a few any more than I want education for a few or freedom for a few. He wanted all levels of society to be surrounded by beauty and he wanted art to be a part of daily life and to form a cohesive whole. And these were also objectives of the uh, Art Nouveau designers. He also believed in the equality of the fine and the decorative arts. And as we've already seen from Alistair Duncan, this was also a conviction of the arts of the uh, Art Nouveau designers.
So what about the visual properties of uh, Art Nouveau? As I've mentioned, it can um, vary widely, and these properties can also be contradictory. But there are certain properties that are very closely associated with Art Nouveau, and I've listed four of them here, although this is by no means comprehensive. First, curvilinear forms. Uh, intertwined lines, um, it, it, these uh, curves like you see in this wall hanging. This is a silk embroidery by the German designer Hermann Obrist, and he uh, entitled it Cyclamen. But a critic wrote that it reminded him of the v sudden violent curves generated by the crap, crack of a whip, and so it became known instead as the whiplash. And the curves of Art Nouveau are sometimes described as whiplash curves. A second common characteristic is motifs from nature. Uh, animals, plants, insects, uh, poppies and lilies and irises were especially popular and they're also often found entwined in a woman's long flowing hair and dragonflies and uh, peacocks and uh, swans and butterflies were also very popular. And here you see the reference to nature in two lamps by Tiffany, the wisteria lamp and the dragonfly lamp. The female figure was a common subject of Art Nouveau designers. And here you see that in this poster for Job cigarette papers. And the Art Nouveau women were often shown as femme fatales, or fairies, or sirens. And here you see a winged sylph in this uh, dog collar necklace by Rene Lalique. And asymmetry, although you'll also find symmetrical Art Deco designs, it is contradictory. And here is an asymmetrical pattern in the back of a side chair designed by Hector Gamar, who maintained that which must be avoided in everything that is continuous is the parallel and symmetry. Nature is the greatest builder, and nature makes nothing that is parallel and nothing that is symmetrical. What about the sources of these characteristics? What were Art Nouveau designers looking at? One of the sources were um, scientific texts published in the late 19th century with beautiful illustrations of plant and animal life. And here you see some sea anemones and some sea creatures. And here's a field poppy. And it wasn't just scientific texts. Fantastic, whoops, fantastic uh, plants and sea creatures are also found in illustrated editions of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The 19th century was also a time when many conservatories were being constructed in Europe, and visitors could go and view exotic plants. Here's the Palm House in Vienna, and the Temperate House in Kew Gardens at, uh, in London. Other influential texts were floriated ornament by the Gothic revivalist Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin and the grammar of ornament by the British architect and theorist Owen Jones. This book contained 100 plates illustrating patterns and objects from around the world and across time. And here are two examples. And the last chapter depicted leaves and flowers in various stages of abstraction to show how the motifs and patterns in the previous pages could be applied. They weren't meant to be copied, but rather reinterpreted. And the women in Art Nouveau designs with their long flowing hair resemble the women seen in paintings by the Pre-Raphaelites, a, a group of British artists active in the mid-19th century who uh, often depicted their women as femme fatales like Lady Lilith or as um, muses or spirits. Art Nouveau can be found in most European countries and in many other parts of the world as well. So how was it disseminated? 
Well, among the means of dissemination were galleries and shops that showcased Art Nouveau, like Les Maisons de l'Art Nouveau, which was uh, a gallery uh, that was established by the German-born dealer Siegfried Bing in Paris in 1895. And on the right, you can see the interior of the shop. It featured rooms that were filled with Art Deco furniture. Excuse me, I do a lot of work on Art Deco too, and sometimes I slip up. Uh, it was filled with Art Nouveau furniture and uh, wall hangings and decorative arts. Another one was Les Maisons Modernes, which was also in Paris, and Liberty in London. Graphic designers embraced Art Nouveau, and they often applied it in their posters. And these posters were hung on walls and fences along city streets, especially in Paris. And this exposed the general public to Art Nouveau. This is a poster advertising La Maison Moderne. And here's the one we saw earlier for uh, Job's cigarette papers. International exhibitions held in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, introduced architects and designers and the general public to Art Nouveau. And two of the most important were the Universal Exposition held in Paris in 1900 and the International uh, Exposition of Modern Decorative Arts held in 1902 in Turin, Italy. And this was the first international exposition to be dedicated uh, exclusively to modern decorative arts. There were also magazines dedicated to Art Nouveau, La Plume in France, Pan and Jugend in Germany, and Versacrum in Vienna. I want to spend the rest of the time uh, showing you examples of Art Nouveau in various parts of the world with a special emphasis on those areas where it was so prevalent. Some of the earliest examples of Art Nouveau can be found in England, specifically in the work of the British architect and graphic designer and craftsman Arthur McMurdo. This is the title page that he designed for his book, Wren's City Churches. And you can see that it has these slender stalks that are topped with stylized flowers that appear to be swaying in the wind. Some historians consider this to be an early example of Art Nouveau, and that's how I feel about it. But others consider it to be a precursor of Art Nouveau. They call it Proto Nouveau. And that's probably because it preceded the full emergence of this movement by about 10 years. And you see that same rhythmic, dynamic, move, dynamic movement in the back of this chair that was designed by Matt Murdo. But um, Art Nouveau, although it exists in England, did not catch on there like it did in some other areas of Europe, like Brussels, Belgium. This is the Tassel House. It's uh, in Brussels, Belgium. It was designed by Victor Horta, and it's generally considered to be the first Art Nouveau building. It was really revolutionary in its time, primarily because of its use of iron, an industrial material, in a residential building. The windows uh, at the mezzanine level, that's the lowest level here in, in this uh, slide, were separated by stocky stone colonnettes, divided them into six panels. But you don't see anything here of the classical orders. Uh, rather, they, um, the bases look like the roots of a plant, and the capitals seem to curl up to grip that uh, iron beam overhead. So it was much more organic. At the next level, you have the window divided by uh, colonnettes that line up with the ones below, but these are made of iron rather than of stone. And here you see those whiplash curves in the railings on the exterior of the building. You find these curves in the interior as well. This is the entrance hall. And here's the mosaic tile floor. These slender iron columns at the foot of the staircase 
are topped with these vase-like capitals with, uh, that appear to have tendrils sprouting out of them. And there's more whiplash uh, curves on the balustrade and on the mural on the wall of the um, staircase. It looks like plants that are struggling to reach the light coming through this skylight at the top. <coughs> Henry van de Velde was another Belgian designer. He was very prolific and he worked in a variety of mediums. He, his work employs those curvilinear forms, but, it, um, but his references to nature are less overt than you see in the work of some other Belgian designers. This kidney-shaped desk and the accompanying uh, writing and the accompanying chair is uh, filled with this energetic flowing movement. And you see the great attention to detail in these uh, flowing uh, whiplash curves of the drawer pools. Philippe Wolfers was a Belgian jeweler, and this is one of his works, the Wisteria Choker. Traditionally, jewelry was designed to showcase precious stones, especially diamonds. But Art Nouveau jewelers worked with less precious gems and uh, non-traditional materials. The blossoms here are carved opals and watermelon tourmalines. And the vines curve around this gold frame that's studded with garnets and rubies and seed pearls. The leaves represent an enamel technique called plique a jour, which means light of day. It's similar to, clo to cloisonne in the sense that it's created by forming these little metal boxes and filling them with um, molten glass. But the boxes don't have a back to them as they do in cloisonne. So it's sometimes called uh, backless cloisonne. And that allows the light to uh, penetrate the uh, underside of them. Moving to Paris, France, we already saw this side chair designed by Hector Guimard, but he's best known as the designer of the entrances to the Paris Metro. He won this commission as the result of a competition, and he designed essentially three different types of metro entrances. The simplest and the most common has an open staircase surrounded by a wrought iron railing with these uh, slender wrought iron posts that look like plant stems, and they support the metropolitan sign and also these amber light bulbs that look like flower buds. The second type has a covered stairwell and a glass canopy that looks like the wings of a dragonfly. And the third type was a freestanding uh, pavilion with a waiting room and a pagoda-like roof. Guimard designed about 140 of these stations, and about 86 remain today. <coughs> René Lalique is probably best known today for his glass designs, but he, became his, he began his career as a jeweler. And like other Art Nouveau jewelers, he used non-traditional materials like mother of pearl and ivory and semi-precious stones, sometimes com combined with more ex expensive gems. In this necklace, these uh, fire opals are surrounded by these swirling gold tendrils and they alternate with attenuated female forms with swirling hair and their arms extend downward to enclose, uh, form a border for the uh, enamel and gold swans and the cabochon amethyst. Jules Charest has been called the father of the modern poster. And this is a poster that he designed for an appearance by the um, uh, modern American dancer Loie Fuller at the Follies Bergère. Uh, Fuller wore these billowing gowns that would swirl around her as she danced, and you can see that on the uh, right. Uh, Sheree typically incorporated young, attractive, liberated, free-spirited women into his uh, posters. They drank and smoked and wore low-cut gowns, and here you see two examples in another ad for Job's cigarette papers and uh, one for an event at the Moulin Rouge. 
Art Nouveau in Glasgow, Scotland, tended to be more restrained than we've seen in uh, in Paris and in Brussels. Overall, it was more rectilinear than curvilinear, although sometimes curvilinear and rectilinear forms would be combined. And the name most associated with Art Nouveau in Scotland, and specifically Glasgow, is Charles Rennie Mackintosh. In the 1890s, he received the commission through a competition to design the Glasgow School of Art, and it is considered his greatest work. It combines heavy masonry Scottish baronial architecture with Art Nouveau elements, like this relief on the left that's over the entrance. At the center is what's called the Glasgow Rose and female figures to either side. And on the right, you see these open flowery knots on top of the brackets that brace the window at the second floor. And here's a look at the uh, library in the Glasgow School of Art, or at least what was the library in the Glasgow School. Unfortunately, over the past 10 years, there have been two devastating fires there. They gutted the library. Uh, work is underway to uh, restore the building, but it's uh, not going to be completely open until 2030. Macintosh is probably best known for his designs for Catherine or Kate Cranston's tea rooms in Glasgow. He designed his first high back chair for the Argyle Street tea rooms. And you can see that the, uh, uh, the uh, headrest has a stenciled design that looks like the body and the birds of a, the, the body and the wings of a bird in flight. And this is another high back chair that he designed for the Ingram Street tea rooms. It has a severely elongated back and uh, small squares pierce those tall central slats. And this is the cashier's chair for the Willow Street tea rooms with a stylized willow tree in the stylized back. During its early phases, Art Nouveau in Vienna was characterized by the curvilinear forms and the references to nature that we've seen in Brussels and Paris. But at the turn of the century, it uh, took a different direction. It became more uh, symmetrical and incorporated more geometric forms, uh, most commonly the square, which formed checkerboard and grid designs. In 1897, a, uh, I just mentioned that Art Nouveau in Vienna is sometimes called the secession style. And in 1897, a group of um, Viennese painters, sculptors, architects, graphic artists, um, who wanted to develop a new uh, aesthetic that was appropriate for a modern world, formed the Vienna Secession. They, they withdrew or seceded from the conservative art association that was promoting traditional styles. This was their logo. And this postcard shows the uh, building that was designed to hold the secessionist exhibitions. Here's a historic photo of it and a more contemporary view. It was designed by Joseph Maria Olberg. It's essentially an arrangement of cubic forms topped by this intricate cupola that was made up of more than 3,000 gilded wrought iron laurel leaves. There was a floral uh, frieze at the top of the wall, and it uh, extended into those trees that you see on either side of the entrance. And above the entrance was a relief with three gorgons representing architecture, painting, and sculpture. The secession building was uh, heavily damaged during World War II, which you see here. After the war, it was hastily patched up, but then in the succeeding decades, it was renovated and many original elements had been restored. And there are still exhibitions that are held there today. In 1903, two members of the secession, Joseph Hoffman and Coleman Moser, 
uh, formed a cooperative, a manufacturing cooperative of artist craftsmen who produced well-designed uh, objects, often handmade, for everyday use. And this cooperative was called the Wiener Werkstatt, or the Vienna Workshop. Their first major commission was the Palais Stockley. And it was not in Vienna, it was in Brussels, Belgium. But it was commissioned by a, a Viennese businessman who was living there. It's another arrangement of um, rectilinear forms. It was designed by Joseph Hoffman. The walls are covered with marble, and the seams are gilded bronze. The tower contains the staircase, and it's surrounded by these uh, bronze nudes. The most spectacular um, room inside is the dining room, which has a two-panel mural that was designed by Gustav Klimt. The, uh, the it's a, a mosaic, and the theme here is the tree of life. And the tree of life is at the center of each panel, and the branches extend throughout the composition. Uh, the uh, panels are on the long side of the room. This is one of them called Expectation. And it features this single female figure uh, who's called Expectation, or sometimes the dancer. And on the other wall is Fulfillment, showing this embracing couple. So this is the fulfillment of Expectation. Art Nouveau in uh, Catalonia has a personality all its own. It's not like anything that we've seen before. It combines Moorish and Gothic elements with Catalan traditions and Art Nouveau elements. And the designer most associated with Art Nouveau in um, Barcelona is Antoni Gaudi. In 1900, Gaudi was commissioned by a Barcelona entrepreneur to design a suburban colony based on the Garden City concept. Today it's known as Park Güell, named after the developer. It wasn't very successful. Very few lots were sold, and um, none of the few houses that were built there were designed by Gaudi. But he did design these uh, two pavilions or guard houses at the entrance to the development. They're covered with rough stone, and you can see that one of them has this uh, turret of blue and white tiles in a checkerboard pattern. Beyond the entrance is this monumental double staircase. And in the center, near the top, a little hard to see in this image, but there is a dragon. This is what he looks like. And his scales are made up of ceramic tiles. He's become somewhat of a mascot for Park Well. This is another of Gaudí's designs, Casa Mia. It's an apartment building in Barcelona with these undulating walls also covered in rough stone, which gave it its nickname, La Pereira, which is the quarry. After Gaudí finished Casa Milla, he devoted the rest of his life to the church of La Sagrada Familia. And when he died, the church remained unfinished. And it stood abandoned in Barcelona for many decades. And then toward the end of um, the 1990s, it was decided uh, to restore the church. So uh, to, to uh, not restore it, but to complete the church, to build it. Um, it's anticipated that it will be completed in uh, 2026. So it's getting close. Uh, before he died, Gaudí did complete the nativity facade, which is named for the nativity scene that you see toward the top. And there are other events related to it, like the Magi and the flight into Egypt. There are also a lot of uh, references to nature in La Sagrada Familia. I could probably talk for 40 minutes about that church alone. But here's just one of them. This is this giant turtle that's at the base of one of the columns on the nativity facade. Gaudí is probably the best known Art Nouveau designer in Barcelona, but he's not the only one. Luis Domenici Montanay also designed several Art Nouveau buildings in Barcelona, and this is one of them. This is the Palau de la Musica Catalana, or the Palace of Catalan Music. 
At the uh, mezzanine level, there's a double colonnade, and the columns are covered with uh, um, a um, ceramic tile mosaic, most of them in a floral pattern. This is the interior. This is the auditorium. And it's topped by this uh, stained glass skylight in the form of an inverted dome. <laughs> the back of the stage is uh, covered with these muses. They're against a, a red, crimson red mosaic background. And the upper parts of their body are sculpted. The lower parts are mosaic. They all hold a different instrument, and they wear costumes from different eras. Uh, Art Nouveau designers in um, the United States did not embrace Art Nouveau the way that the Europeans did. But you do have some Art Nouveau here. Uh, and the name most associated it, with it is Louis Comfort Tiffany, who founded Tiffany Studios. He was the uh, son of the founder of the um, jewelry and silver company. Tiffany developed a special type of glass. It was called Fabrile glass. And it was made by exposing molten glass to metallic oxides. And the glass absorbed the oxides, and that gave the glass an iridescent effect. Most of Tiffany's designs were inspired by nature. And he used this Fabrile glass in many of his flower form designs. Here's one example, this flower form vase, which has an amber foot and this slender translucent green stem, and the blossom transitions from amber to yellow to green at the rim. The rarest of Tiffany's flower form vases is the Jack in the Pulpit, which you see here, which has a peacock blue foot and stem and an iridescent gold blossom. Tiffany is probably best known for his lamps. And I had another one in here that I'm missing. Um, the uh, lamps, unlike stained glass windows, the lamps were not leaded. They were made using a copper foil technique. So a copper foil solution was applied to the edges of the glass to allow them to adhere, and then they were soldered. Uh, at one time, it was thought that Louis uh, Comfort... Uh, Tiffany designed all of his lamps, but research over about the last 20 to 25 years has shown that he employed a number of designers, many of them women. And a woman named Clara Driscoll was responsible for this dragonfly design, as well as the wisteria design that we saw earlier. There's not much uh, Art Nouveau architecture in this country. But the curvilinear forms and the uh, nature motifs that you find in Art Nouveau are also seen in the ornamentation on buildings designed by Louis Comfort, excuse me, Louis Sullivan, um, the architect who's best known uh, as giving form to the American skyscraper. And you see this lush organic ornamentation on his guarantee building in Buffalo and also on the Rain Wainwright building in St. Louis. This is an example of Art Nouveau architecture in Munich, uh, Germany, designed by August Endel. It had this um, very elaborate, almost bizarre stucco decoration on the facade. Looks to me like a dragon. And it was originally painted in gold and red on the green facade. But every year, it was repainted a different color. And you can see uh, a different color scheme on the lower right. Here are more whiplash curves on the grill at one of the entrances. And this is the interior. And <laughs> here at the... Uh, at, at, on the staircase, you see these uh, these forms that look like plants uh, sprouting from the railing. In 1938, the Nazi party ordered what they called the hideous facade disrupting the character of the rest of the street uh, removed so that it wouldn't offend Hitler when he came to Munich for... Whoops when he came to Munich for the Day of German Art, when the House of German Art was being inaugurated. So the facade was removed, 
And, um, and then in 1944, the building was bombed, so it doesn't exist anymore. Endel referred to his uh, designs, the type of his designs, as octopus rococo. <laughs> but critics referred to this building as the Dragon House or the Chinese Embassy. You also see some of these bizarre dragon-like forms in the furniture that he designed. And uh, this is an example, this sideboard. This is a charming ho central hotel in um, Prague. And it has this stucco decoration, these tree branches with gilded fruit on the uh, facade. And there is a female face looking down on the underside of that bay. Oops. And here's a detail. Fyodor Schechtel is uh, the architect who's most associated with Art Nouveau in Moscow, although you don't hear that name very frequently. But this is one of his designs. This is the Raya Bashinsky house. You can see a lot of curvilinear forms here, especially in the ironwork on the windows. Here's a more contemporary look at it. And here's the interior which, with what's been called the melting staircase. And there's a jellyfish um, lamp at the base that almost looks like, looks like it's floating. Rome is best known for its ancient and its Renaissance art and architecture. But there is a little known district in Rome uh, that has a cluster of Art Nouveau buildings. It's called the Copidae District, named after Gino Copidae, an architect who worked there between 1915 and 1927. This, uh, it's uh, not well known at all, and some people who live in Rome aren't even aware of it. The um, center of the district is the Piazza Mincio with the Fountain of the Frogs. On the upper basin, you see these eight frogs looking inward, and they're spewing water into the basin. And the lower level has four basins that are supported on the backs of female figures, also with frogs spewing water. <laughs> this is one of the buildings in the district. It's, uh, it faces the piazza and the fountain of the frogs, and it's called the Spider Palace. It's a combination, a little bit bizarre combination of uh, Babylon and Assyrian architecture with uh, all sorts of uh, strange animals like uh, griffins, and um, there are also some Art Nouveau elements as well. And it gets its name from the spider that's over the entrance. And then you can see a helmeted head above that. And here's a detail of that spider. Uh, Art Nouveau can also be found in Latin America. And this is an, ex this is an example from Buenos Aires in uh, Argentina. At the turn of the century, there were a lot of Europeans who uh, emigrated to Argentina, and they wanted houses that would express their wealth and prosperity, and this is an example. The Casa de los Liros means the house of the lilies, and the name comes from the lily stems and flowers and leaves that you see on the undersides of the balcony. Another example and around the windows and underneath the roof line, on the grill work at the entrance, and on this interior doorway. With the establishment of the Cuban Republic in 1902, Cuban architects started to turn away from styles that were popular during the colonial period and to adopt new approaches to architecture like Art Nouveau. And one of the most um, impressive Art Nouveau buildings in uh, Havana is the Palacio Cueto, which you see here just off this square. It's hard to get a good uh, image of it, um, but it's off the uh, Plaza Viejo in Havana. And it is just covered with all sorts of Art Nouveau motifs. It was originally a hat factory, and then in the 1920s it was... Uh, 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 it became a hotel, and it's once again a hotel today, a very nice hotel. 
it's covered with forms like uh, satyrs and griffins. And here at the entrance, you can see it's guarded by these fawns that are surrounded by foliage. And you can see uh, the name of the, ho of the building above and the date above that. Here you can see the date a little better, 1906. This is an Art Nouveau house in Camagüey, Cuba. Camagüey is in East Central Cuba. I don't know the exact date, and I don't know the architect, but he was probably a master Catalan builder because he patterned the house after Antoni Gaudí's Casa Batlo in Barcelona. They have similar roof lines with that turret-like minaret on top. And they both incorporate Catalan tiles. Here you see some of the tile work on the house in Camagüey. At the time that Art Nouveau was flourishing in Europe, the uh, predominant style in Australia it was what has become known as the Federation style. The Federation style had its roots in English, Queen Anne, and Edwardian architecture. But the ornamentation uh, incorporated Australian themes like local flora and fauna and um, uh, motifs like the rising sun, which symbolized a new dawn for Australia. Milton House in Sydney is a rare combination of the Federation style with Art Nouveau. The Federation style is represented by the symmetry of the building. There's deep overhanging eaves and the coins, which are these horizontal moldings at the corner of the building. But Art Nouveau is reflected by the curvilinear molding over the doorway, the design in the lunette, the um, frieze just above the base, and here's a detail of it, this pattern in the bricks between the windows, it looks to me like a potted tree. And the curvilinear railings. This nationalistic spirit is also seen in the furniture designed by Robert Prenzel. Prenzel was from Prussia, but he came to Australia in the late 1880s and he settled there. He's especially known for his bedroom suites, and this is one of them, the Matthias Suite, and it was named for the client who commissioned it. And you can see that there are gum nuts and a kookaburro on the doors, and they also appear on the footboard of the bed. And here's a kangaroo design on another piece. You also find Art Nouveau in Japan, where it was especially popular for these postcards. Um, here's one example, another one by the same artist. So I'm uh, going to end by going through a number of images and showing, keeping them on the screen for only a few seconds, but I just want to show you how pervasive Art Nouveau was. You find it in Mexico, Costa Rica, Bolivia, Uruguay, Denmark, Estonia, Bulgaria, Greece, Malta, China, Tunisia, Turkey, and even in Cairo, Egypt. So thank you again for coming today, and I believe we have time for questions, if anyone has any questions, or we can talk out in the foyer. Thank you. to quickly differentiate between Art Nouveau and Art Deco.
Art Nouveau is more uh, curvilinear than Art Deco. You do find curvilinear forms in Art Deco, but they're more sweeping. They're not quite as intricate. Um, you also find more references to, um, in the ornamentation, you find a lot of references to industrialization in Art Deco, like modern means of transportation. But they're the same in that they both stress modernity. But uh, it was in the sense of Art Nouveau, it was more the modernity of a different approach to design. It's not classical, it's not Gothic, it's something different, it's something we haven't seen before. The same was true for Art Deco, but when you say modernity, you also see that expressed in um, the ornamentation, images from the modern world, like the airplane. Thank you. That's just one difference. but. <laughs> Are there any Anybody other questions? Else? I think there's one over here. You showed us the slide of the buildings, the facade getting the Oh, yes. So I'm wondering if there are any other political, governmental, church, or institutional um, sanctions on Art Nouveau. On Art Nouveau. Not that I'm aware of. It wasn't always popular, like the Gamar stations. I, I don't. I don't know of anything specifically like the the Endel House in Munich. But uh, some of the Gamar stations, after they were built in Paris, the metro stations. Oh, maybe after a while, it was thought, no, they're looking uh, maybe a little out of date because the Art Nouveau really didn't last for all that long, for um, compared to some other styles and these revival styles. So uh, some of those uh, metro stations were unfortunately lost because the municipal decided that now we'll tear them down and replace them with something else. Um, but I, I, it's an interesting question, and I, um, but I don't know of any other examples right off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'm wondering, could you make a case for Frank Lloyd Wright being uh, an Art Nouveau architect? I think I think you you um, you could in some of his ornamentation, and you could also make a, a case for him being a little bit Art Deco too. So I think uh, in in not so much in the um, the building design, uh, but in some of the ornamentation, some of his stained glass windows, um, they show a little bit of of uh, of nouveau. But I think of nouveau and deco, he would. He would lean a little more toward Art Deco if you were putting him in, into those categorizations. So I don't think it's a strong case. My question is similar to Keith, I guess, or builds on it. I had always thought of Charles Rennie Macintosh as being representative of arts and crafts, period. So is there an overlap or flow between Art Nouveau and arts and crafts? There's, um, there's yes, there's definitely. An, uh, uh, some similarities there. The biggest difference is this this attitude toward industrialization, that the Art Nouveau designers would be willing to accept it, the arts and crafts designers not so much, but in the sense that they wanted, they both wanted a harmonious whole, they both wanted the equality of the fine and applied arts, they both, um, uh, even though you find, uh, you find Art Nouveau and arts and crafts architecture, but in both cases they were heavily oriented toward the, the decorative arts. Um, so there are some similarities, but um, uh, uh, Macintosh is, um, his work is not as, like I, I mentioned, it's more rectilinear, it's not so curvilinear, you don't see as many, uh, you do see some natural references, but, but um, Macintosh did exhibit with the secessionists, they, they invited him to exhibit with them. And I think you see a big influence of his work on, on the secessionists in, in Vienna. Where in this area would you suggest that we go to see uh, examples? Are you, we heard from other parts of the world, but I was wondering about Chicago area. Chicago. Um, gosh, I, I recently learned about one apartment building that's it's in the city, but not right downtown. Um, but I can't remember where it was, but I can email that inf information to, to Judy or to, to Becky. Um, there's also a building on um, Dearborn, I believe. Uh, it was originally a house, and it's, um, 
it's, I think it's a, a Jewish student center today. It's, it has a specific name, but I can't remember the name of it. Maybe somebody knows what, what that's specifically called. But um, that's a very rare example. But you, you don't really find too much Art Nouveau. I, I, there's not, not even clusters like the, the Art Deco buildings in Miami Beach. I don't know of any place uh, in this country where there's a, a real collection of Art Nouveau. They're just, you know, here and there, but especially rare in, in, in architecture. And Louis Sullivan's ornamentation is considered Art Nouveau. Nicholas Pevsner, who a, a, was a very well-known British architectural historian, um, said that uh, Louis Sullivan's architecture was art, uh, at least the ornamentation, was Art Nouveau. But, um, but there's, there's very, very little of it here. I wish I could. I, I would say Brussels, Belgium has great Art Nouveau buildings. Uh, there's a lot of Guimard buildings. I didn't show his, his uh, architecture, but he did some apartment buildings in, in Paris. Um, so yeah, take a trip to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How about the Cars and Perry Scott building? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. The ornamentation on that building. I just chose a few of them. <laughs> I was just wondering, as beautiful as these buildings are, structurally and engineering-wise, do they take a lot of retrofitting, and or are they designed well to hold up all on their own from the original construction. I know that a number of them have undergone restorations, but I have not heard that 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 they there is a special uh, a problem with Art Nouveau as compared to other historic styles. And there was a lot of iron in those buildings, so a lot of the materials were industrial and they were durable. Um, but there's certainly been restoration over the years, but I don't know of any specific problems. Any other questions? If not, too, Kathleen will be downstairs. <laughs> Thank you.